All right, this PowerPoint presentation will focus on the Australopithecines and early members of genus Homo. This will correlate with Chapter 10 in the Explorations textbook, as well as Chapter 10 in the, in the Essentials textbook, and it will correlate with Lab Number 15 for the Biological Anthropology Lab. The Australopiths as a genus, the date range is between 4 million years ago all the way up to about 1 million years, 1 million years ago, which is the early Pliocene to the early Pleistocene. The Australopiths are all habitual bipeds, so recalling from our last presentation that's a combination of bipedalism and arboreal climbing. It's likely that the Australopiths were utilizing these forms of locomotion relatively equally. Uh, bipedal when traveling on the ground or when standing on branches to reach higher hanging fruits, and then retaining arboreal climbing and possibly some degree of brachiation. Cranial capacity for the Australopithecus ranges from about 350 to 550 cc's, which is still relatively small. We're not going to see a huge jump in brain size or cranial capacity until we get to genus Homo. Um, we do know, based upon fossil evidence, that bipedal locomotion predated expansion in cranial capacity by millions of years. The Australopithecines are going to be grouped into two main groups. The first is going to be the gracile forms, which are always called the Australopithecines, and the robust forms. Some paleoanthropologists give them their own genus, which is called Paranthropus. Um, other paleoanthropologists do not distinguish them as a separate genus, they call them all the Australopithecines and just distinguish them as gracile and robust. So the first one we're going to look at is Australopithecus anamensis. This is the earliest Australopith in the fossil record to, record to date, at least based on what's been discovered thus far. Um, this one dates to about four million years ago in Eastern Africa. So similar to the Artipithecus fossil and many of the Australopithecines, you're going to see a very mosaic anatomy. So remember that mosaic just means mixture of more primitive and derived features. So some of the more primitive features that we see with anamensis is relatively larger canines. Um, postcranial anatomy, postcranial just means from the neck down, um, indicates that anamensis was a habitual biped, not an obligate. It is hypothesized by many paleoanthropologists that Anamensis may be a direct descendant of Artipithecus ramidus and may also be ancestral to other Australopithecines. Uh, next one we're going to talk about is Australopithecus afarensis. That big long name means southern ape from the Afar region. The Afar region is in Ethiopia in eastern Africa. Uh, the most famous fossil attributed to the species is Lucy fossil, discovered by Donald Johansson. Uh, Lucy is a very complete fossil. Um, Donald Johansson and colleagues uncovered about 40% of Lucy's skeleton. The date range for the species is between about 3 to 3.6 million years ago. The habitat would have been a mixture of woodland and grassland. So thinking back to the savanna hypothesis from the last presentation, um, it's possible that with the Lucy fossil and onward, we see more of a commitment to bipedalism. So again, that road from habitual bipedalism to obligate bipedalism. Um, anatomical features, again, very mosaic, mixed anatomy, habitual biped because uh, features like relatively longer arms, curved finger bones that are suggesting that the species retained some degree of arboreal climbing. Um, relatively small, non-honing canine, which is typical of what you'd see in a member of the human line. Um, one of the more ape-like features is slightly more prognathic face. Um, prognathic face, when you're looking at a lateral view or a view from the side, prognathism is talking about to what degree does the mid-face and the jaw project forward. So for the Lucy fossil, it is more projecting than you would see in a modern human, but less projecting than in a chump, so somewhere right in between. Um, the hyoid bone is a U-shaped bone in the vocal tract that's critical in reconstructing the capacity for language. Um, most paleoanthropologists believe that the Australopithecines likely did not have language, at least not to modern day capacities. It's you know, likely that they vocalize just like all primates do, um, but Lucy likely did not have anatomical capabilities for language based upon her hyoid bone. Um, cranial capacity of the species, um, you know, looking at 300 to 400 cc's, um, but for all Australopithecines looking somewhere between 350 to 500 cc's. 
This species is possibly a direct descendant of Australopithecus anamensis, the last fossil that we looked at. So here's another one of those summary slides. You know, this is all information we've already gone over, but this, these slides are going to be really helpful when you're going through looking for key, um, key traits like the date and anatomical features, cranial capacity that go along with each fossil. All right, this next one is Australopithecus africanus. Um, the nickname for this particular fossil is Mrs. Place. Although originally thought to be female, based upon more evidence, it's likely that this fossil is a male. Um, still debated. The date range for this fossil, or the date for this fossil, is about two and a half million years old, um, discovered in southern Africa. And for some of the features, you're going to see a slightly more rounded cranial shape, um, less, less prognathism, less projecting face. We're not seeing any cranial crest, like a sagittal crest. We'll talk about the sagittal crest here in a moment when we get to the robust forms and relatively small non-honing canines. Uh, next fossil is Australopithecus sediba. Uh, sediba means wellspring. This fossil was discovered by Lee Berger and his son, Matthew Berger. The site is Malapa Cave. Uh, the limestone cave environment allowed for very accurate radiometric dating. Um, so right around 2 million years ago, more specifically 1.97, so that would have been the middle place to see. Um, the habitat would have been a mixture of forest and grassland. This has been proposed by many paleoanthropologists to be a possible direct ancestor of genus Homo. However, this is debated since we know that some members of genus Homo actually predate the species. Some Homo habilis fossils go back as far as 2.5 million years ago. Um, anatomical features, relatively small brain, you know, right in within that range of what we see with the other Australopithecines, as four, you know, right at 420 cc's for this fossil. Um, mosaic anatomy, so relatively small body and longer arms, indicating that habitual bipedalism, so a mixture of being bipedal but also retaining the capacity for arboreal climbing. Relatively hand-like, hand, -like, hand human-like hand and pelvis, mosaic foot. Um, features like smaller teeth, uh, smaller mandibles, and zygomatic archer, arches um, than the other Australopithecines are suggesting a place in the ancestry of genus Homo. So the zygomatic arches, those are the cheekbones. Um, after you finish viewing this PowerPoint presentation, please go and view the section of Dawn of Humanity. This is a PBS documentary. The director is Townsley, published in 2015. So you will start at 28 minutes in and end at 34. So this is going to be available through Films on Demand on the Canvas portal. And I will look for other links for you guys as well, but if, as long as you go into Canvas, you'll be able to access this film clip free of charge. All right, Australopithecus gari is another fossil that, or another species that has been proposed to be a possible direct descendant of genus Homo. This particular fossil was uncovered in Ethiopia and Eastern Africa. Uh, the date of this fossil, right around two and a half million years old. Habitat would have been more of a woodland habitat. Anatomical features, um, relatively large premolars and molars. The posterior dentition is relatively large. Um, prognathic jaw. Um, however, the more derived or modern features are the human-like humerus to femur ratio. So the femur is longer in comparison to the humerus, which is what we would see in a typical biped. Uh, so because of that, also because of the possible association with basic stone tool technologies, it has been proposed to be a probable ancestor of genus Homo. Um, cranial capacity is still relatively small within the range of what you'd see of all the Australopithecines. Um, the fir possibly the first user and maker of stone tools because you see these fossils uncovered in association with antelope bones with cut marks indicating that these hominins may have processed or um, scavenged these particular bones. All right, now we're going to go into the robust forms. So recalling we have two groups of Australopithecines, the gracile or more delicate forms, and then the larger, more robust forms. So it really depends on who you're talking to. Some paleoanthropologists group all of these Australopithecines together and call them all Australopithecines, and some paleoanthropologists give the robust forms their own genus, calling them Paranthropus. So some of the common features that you're going to see in all of the robust forms, um, smaller anterior dentition, larger posterior dentition, so smaller incisors and canines, 
larger premolars and molars. Um, cranial capacity, right between 410 to about 510 cc's. Um, you're also going to see a feature in the robust worms called the sagittal crest. Um, I like to call it the bony mohawk. It's kind of this ridge or projection of bone that's going straight down the sagittal suture or the center of, of the cranium, so in between the, the, the parietal bones here. Um, dietary focus would have been predominantly harder, tougher food items, uh, mainly fibrous vegetation that requires a lot more chewing force. So the sagittal crest, the anatomical purpose of it is the attachment of the chewing muscles. So the chewing muscles would start down here at the jaw, go underneath the zygomatic bones, and attach all the way up at the sagittal crest. So just to review, some paleoanthropologists give them their own genus, also called paranthropus, while others include them with genus Australopithecines. All right, this is just another one of those summary slides for you guys. All right, this one here is Paranthropus boisei. Um, the nickname for this one is Nutcracker Man. However, it is now believed that Paranthropus boisei didn't eat predominantly nuts, but more likely consumed mainly tough vegetation, such as sedges and grasses. Um, really distinctive looking fossil, really wide concave face, enormous flat molars, the largest that we see in the robust forms. Their molars are four times bigger than what we see in modern Homo sapiens. Um, really massive jaw, really pronounced zygomatic arch, and a sagittal crest, that bony mohawk. So not quite as pronounced as what you saw with the black skull, um, but still significant. So for the robust forms, when you see that sagittal crest there, what that means is that's the attachment of the chewing muscles. So the chewing muscles start here, go underneath the zygomatic bone, and then attach all the way up at the sagittal crest. Um, cranial capacity is on the larger end for the Australopithecines, but still not significant, um, right around 530 cc's for this fossil. Um, this one here is a new discovery. This is Australopithecus 